Hello. Welcome, guys. Hello. Good evening. Hello, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Please come in, have a seat. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome. Hello guys, welcome. So guys, welcome everyone. Welcome to my lecture here in HIPAA. And uh, I'm here already a few days in Dubai, actually chasing some fog in the morning, beautiful sunrises and beautiful time here. Uh, just arrived from Exposure Conference. And here will be my topic, managing light and colors in landscape photography. So when I was invited here in HIPAA, I was actually thinking which topic to choose maybe about post-processing, about composition, but I always think that the most challenging part in landscape photography is actually learning and training your eyes and uh, your brains how to actually manage the color. Yes, it's uh, probably the most uh, essential, most complicated thing ever for photographer. Yeah, guys, just to mention, our lecture our tutorial will be also on live on YouTube. So just be careful when you're asking questions, right? <laughs> otherwise, yeah, otherwise it's all right. It doesn't uh, affect us at all. So color, palette, the color twist here. Yeah, so when I was invited to HIP, I also recall you had uh, once uh, uh, in competition the topic life and color, right? And uh, this kind of uh, corresponds to what we will be talking about today managing color and light in landscape photography. Just to show you a little video here to cheer you up a little bit. Just a short video from Namibia. So this previous image with many colors and star trails, it was actually made out of uh, uh, these time lapses and just stitched in star stacks. I was leaving camera in Namibia. Sauce's play. Just a short one minute video, and uh, then I will also talk about myself a little bit. Just a short introduction what I'm currently doing, which project I'm working on, and then we will continue talking about color and landscape. This is how the star trails were created just accumulating stars. So just a few words quickly about myself. Maybe some of you are already familiar with my works. Maybe some of you have been to my exhibition here at Exposure in Sharjah. But just a few words. I started traveling about uh, photography about 16 years ago. And for the last past eight years, I'm traveling almost nonstop. Nine, ten months per year I was traveling. And even now I'm trying to explore some remote corners of Russia, of, uh, my country I was born in. It's absolutely beautiful country with 
many wild places, so kind of self-isolating myself in wild mountains in Russia. So just came from Siberia here to Dubai. It's about minus 20, minus 30 Celsius. So kind of 50, 60 degrees difference. And <laughs> in two days going back uh, to Moscow where it will be again just minus 30. So my wife sending me videos and photos how I just, how she digs out uh, the car and our yard. And yeah, it's a little bit cold right now in Russia. Uh, from the beach. Yes, and just, it's uh, hot. <laughs> I'm go, like walking in t-shirt. Yeah, but it's perfect. It's winter here in Dubai, and not so hot like in summer. Yeah, anyway, uh, so regarding colors, yeah, and training your eyes for colors. I was studying about six years in uh, painting school, and maybe that's something that affected my works as well, yeah? So it's kind of a transition. Hello, welcome, guys. Okay. No worries. Uh, it's kind of transition uh, between the painting and uh, landscape photography. So on the edge between uh, painting and uh, just traveling, hiking, uh, the passion to landscape photography was born. Yeah? And uh, now I have some long-lasting expeditions, uh, projects. Uh, uh, we go almost every year to Greenland, to Antarctica. I really love sailing boats and sailing in uh, remote uh, polar regions. So basically trying to explore as much as possible. And I really hope that uh, this is a new start, new year. So really hope that we will be able to travel soon again without uh, any restrictions. Uh, but still, I'm trying to explore remote places. Little bit about my equipment. So th <laughs> this is how I usually look like here at, in Siberia, in Russia, uh, and uh, what I carry with me. Uh, my current set is I'm shooting on the Nikon Z7 II using uh, lenses 1424, 2470, and 7200. So these are lenses that are usually in my backpack, always with me. So always it's my cross that I carry using uh, Giza tripods, uh, uh, different types of tripods uh, for hiking, some uh, smaller travel tripods and for uh, some crazy trips in Iceland or Patagonia with strong winds. Uh, it's normally systematic tripods, quite uh, big and sturdy ones. Um, and uh, just some software I'm using as well. Some of uh, the tricks and tips I will show you using this software today as well. And just a few recent uh, expeditions here. You can always go to my Instagram, Daniel Corden, check out where I'm at the moment and check out some past uh, expeditions as well. So this is our plan for today. This is what I will be talking about. We have a quite uh, long master class today. Yeah, so almost uh, three hours, guys. Yeah, it's first part will be devoted to inspiration, education, and color. So where I actually take inspiration and how I train my eye and my brain for these years studying and uh, practicing landscape. And then we will have some introduction to color theory very special things, trying not to just burn your brains today, but still. Then we will go to practice, but maybe before practice we'll have some uh, little pause at 6.15, right? 6.15. Uh, just to chill a little bit, yes, and uh, uh, then we will continue into some practical things. I will show you some examples, some, my some of my photos, and we will practice some editing techniques. I will show you how to Bring the magic to your images, right? At Exposure Conference, my exposition wa was called the uh, Magical World, right? So maybe you can sense the little bit of magic in my images, a bit of softness, and uh, all these beautiful sunrises, sunsets, amazing light. So editing techniques. And uh, of course, some special tips and tricks you also will hear from me today. Color, I really love this uh, quote here, short quote. If you, if you work in color, you have to compose differently. If you shoot in color, it has to be the first thing. So the color, for me personally, it's the main thing in landscape. You cannot separate the composition from color. I always uh, see the image. The color is always comes at the first place. And this is why I also named uh, uh, this master class, uh, Managing Light and Color. 
because light and color is the most essential element of landscape photography. And uh, definitely another quote of uh, Harry Gruyere, I think of photography like therapy. It's therapy for your soul, it's therapy for other people who uh, watch the images of sunrise, sunsets, of uh, beautiful moments. So this is what uh, inspires me. Actually, when people write me messages, they're grateful that uh, just it makes their day better. It makes them dream about uh, visiting places like Antarctica and the dream. It can actually change your life for better. Inspiration. So where was I taking inspiration throughout uh, my life, throughout my career? Sometimes people asking me, like, who's your favorite photographer? And uh, maybe some photographer is your inspiration. But I answer to this question, my inspiration are uh, paintings. Paintings at first place, classics. And here are a few of my really most favorite painters I take inspiration from. So this is, of course, Claude Manet, Paul Signac, absolutely beautiful series of um, Impressionist paintings uh, with boats and uh, very beautiful technique. And Renoir. And of course, a little bit more modern, it's Caspar uh, David Friedrich. Uh, German Romanism, and uh, he really inspired uh, many landscape photographers as well. And Russian painter, Russian painter Ivazovsky, so absolutely incredible, uh, all this ocean and uh, sea scenes. He specialized on the kind of seas seascape, seascape uh, uh, paintings. And uh, on the other hand, it's uh, Caravaggio, how he, manag he manages uh, the light in his scenes, all these dark, moody paintings where you can see the subtle light. And also, this is something to learn from. Of course, all these like, screenshots, they doesn't make, uh, uh, doesn't make uh, the thing. You need to be there. You need to be in gallery to watch all these paintings live. And this is what I did constantly when I was traveling from one place to another. Let's say uh, my most favorite gallery ever, it's Arsay Gallery in Paris, in France. So if I ever, ever just went somewhere through the Paris, I tried to stop over for a while in Paris and uh, uh, go to Arsay Gallery, go to straight to Impressionist painters like Signac and Manet is there and just Look at the paintings, look, analyze them, try to just pass this color through myself. Yeah? So not just uh, consume things, but try to learn how they manage all the colors in paintings, how these colors they speak for themselves. And uh, colors, they really can also tell a story. And this is how you educate yourself, educate your taste, because what happens now that I see even uh, like I see uh, what happens with uh, my kids as well. They spend too much time on devices and social networks, right? And uh, this is something that actually kills the taste at some point. So you consume uh, the content and uh, uh, you uh, don't see too much of the beautiful things, real art. And uh, yeah, there's time to change. It's time to maybe just open. If you haven't got the chance to see the gallery yourself, just buy some album or uh, look through just painter's album at home. So that really helps to educate you and uh, to train your eyesight for some better taste. And it really helps to improve your photography as well. This is not an easy process. It takes years to train your eye on managing the colors. But this was something that really helped me. And at home I have lots of albums, lots of books, and sometimes if I feel not inspired, even I come from some trip and I don't know what to do with the picture, I'm sometimes I'm exhausted after all the flights, after working with uh, my groups. So I just sit uh, in the ch on the chair and uh, take the album and take the inspiration from paintings, from these beautiful colors. That is something that helps a lot. And another thing, let's say, if you go to Uffizi Gallery in Italy, it's um, in the Florence, uh, it's really interesting to study the art, not just the paintings, but uh, understand what was the evolution of the painters. And Uffizi Gallery, if you go there, 
uh, first just you can go to some religious painting and uh, uh, see how the colors, how the perspective uh, was developed. Then you go to Leonardo da Vinci, to Botticelli, and you see fantastic landscapes just painted on the background of uh, this iconic painting. So you understand how people started to use different colors, just started to use perspective and uh, different elements. And then you find Caravaggio in these dark rooms with this subtle light. And this is something also that uh, inspires me in landscape a lot, to create maybe sometimes some moody, dark painting, uh, dark uh, photos inspired by these beautiful paintings. And color theory. Yes, so this is uh, quite essential because the color, on one hand, it can really improve your photo. It can really improve your photography. But on the other hand, it's too powerful that it actually can kill the picture. If you overdone the image, if you're using oversaturated colors, if you have no idea how to manage colors, the color can easily kill your landscape image. So you need to be very careful and understanding the color theory, just knowing the basics of color theory. It also just helps you, it guides you how to create uh, more uh, consistent images. The images that are uh, not destructive, that uh, have uh, just elements uh, that come together in harmony, harmonical images. So we will talk now about color theory and I will show you different uh, color combinations that uh, I'm using in my works as well, in my landscapes. And uh, just show you also some examples of my works and we will discuss how we can apply the color theory to the certain images, to the certain color combinations in landscape. Uh, just a quick introduction about this slide here. Well, uh, there are different color types, primarily secondary and uh, tertiary. And uh, I will show you on the next slide what does it mean. And different color models. One color model is subtractive and another is additive. You know them very well, that's RGB and uh, this is CMYK. And even different colors by themselves, they, uh, they have some expressions like uh, the poet and uh, uh, the person who explored this uh, kind of expressions of the colors. Uh, it was Goethe, maybe the most famous for uh, his works on uh, the color and uh, Maybe the first, the first person who actually invited the color wheel and brought it into life was Isaac Newton, right? So he invited it, but his approach was more scientific. So he uh, didn't pay attention to surroundings, to emotions. And what Goethe actually brought, he brought different uh, kind of expressions of the colors. Let's say like red color, it's intense, it's fire, the blue, color, it's sky, sea, depth, basically different color, it has its own expression. And this expression, it's not only, about, not only about one single color, it's about color combinations, it's about uh, uh, just, uh, how they come together, and it's also about uh, uh, like overall environment you see the color in. Let's say I have a good story about this, about the expression of the color. Uh, when I had a group uh, once in Iceland and uh, we were shooting amazing waterfall there, it's called Gulfos waterfall. And uh, I had my group, about 10 people there, photography workshop. And uh, yeah, we all were staying there in line. It was very cold, very freezing conditions, but absolutely incredible sunrise. So really beautiful pink clouds. And later, when we went into the classroom, I asked, people to process this image just to check the results and uh, how they processing image. And what I found that actually half of the group, they processed this image with flaming skies and just everything was burning there in the sky. And the other half, it was almost like blue and white tones. So no pink color, it was gone. So I started asking them and trying to understand what happened. We were at the same place, just absolutely all in line and all pictures are so different in processing. And I realized that those people who actually called 
they were freezing, they didn't have enough wear, warm jackets, they processed the image in cold tones, in cold colors. Yeah, and those people who uh, were quite warm and good jacket, jackets like puffy penguins, they, they actually uh, processed it in this warm uh, flaming tones. So that means uh, color, it can also express your feelings, right? So you pass uh, the color through yourself and you pass the image through yourself during processing, during this presentation to the viewer and you also add a lot from yourself. So the color is also, it's not just pure science, it's not just a theory, it's also about emotions, it's also about expression of your own feelings. And yeah, here I promised you to just quickly uh, have a look about uh, how uh, colors they actually divided in such groups like primary colors, these are colors red, blue, yellow, and uh, these are pure colors, yes? So they cannot be uh, mix, uh, mixing other colors. The secondary is 50-50, yeah? So for instance, uh, 50 red and uh, 50 yellow makes orange, right? So different colors, why you need to know this? Because we are moving to color wheel. So this is the color wheel. It was uh, found, it was uh, invited by Isaac Newton and it just shows you a like, two-dimensional uh, kind of image of different colors. And now we will talk about uh, different color combinations for landscape images uh, applicable for landscape. Of course, it's not only about uh, photography. You know, when you just renovating your room, apartments, you also think about color combinations, how they match together. And there are a few color combinations uh, that really help to guide you if you are kind of lost when you're just starting processing. Uh, some people just tend to saturate the picture, just overall saturation pushed up and the image is it's just screaming. So it's not that nice, of course. You always need to think about which combinations you have in your image. And uh, sometimes uh, it's processing the image, presenting the image, it's not actually about oversaturating the image. In most cases, it's opposite. It's about desaturating some colors. And this is how you bring the other colors out without even saturating them. So this helps to uh, make the image more strong, more simple sometimes, but bring your idea to the viewer. So the first combination I'm going to talk about, it's uh, analogous combination. So it uses um, uh, colors which are actually just next to each other, like this. Yeah, just have a look. Red, orange, or just green colors, so they all come together. Practical examples. So this is the image from Indonesia, I shot it from drone. Java Island, in, uh, it's called the uh, Tumpak Sivu Waterfall. It's an absolutely crazy place, just some, not from this planet for sure. Uh, incredible and very wild actually. So there's just a small hotel there, but the images you can make absolutely fantastic. Unfortunately, only by drone, but you can still go down there, just down to the waterfall and look at this beauty from below. Yeah, but returning to the colors, to the color combination, it's uh, uh, this combination you can see right here. It's a bit of blue in the sky and the green color, the green color of the landscape. And you see what I'm doing in landscape photography. So of course the initial image, it had a little bit different colors. The sky maybe, it had a little bit more saturated blue color, but I shifted the saturation. I put it down a little bit. So it will be analogous combination, close, to the green, yeah? So this is why you see the color of the sky is quite pale and the, the green color is also subtle. Of course, the original image, uh, I had quite saturated blue sky and I had quite saturated green, but you can't just read the image like this. It's, it was oversaturated. Again, I just pushed down the saturation a little bit. Another analogous combination here, you can see yellow orange. On one hand, you can feel like it's a little bit monochrome, but still, 
looking at this uh, details of the image, you can see a bit of yellow patches in more saturated uh, places and a little bit more like, darker yellow color, something, something already orange, 50-50 secondary color. So it's still uh, analogous combination here. So this picture is from uh, Camargue. It's south of France, running horses. It's an incredible place. I really love interacting with horses. They're just uh, like Pegasus flying above the water. This is the seashore, so they're actually running across the water sometimes, kind of jumping over the waves. And uh, we just uh, capture them with sunset. It's also part of uh, my photography workshop in uh, south of France. And what we do there for five, six days, we communicate with horses, we photograph them running up on the water, on the marshes. They breed the horse, these horses um, uh, for tourists for riding horseback, riding trips in Camargue, but we sneak them out for sunsets, sunrises, like this. Okay, going back to the color. So this image, uh, it uh, has also analogous combination, a subtle green color and a subtle blue color. Again, what helped here a lot is the fog. So the fog rolled in, and this is why I selected this image from South Korea. This is the park just next to Seoul. You just can't see Seoul above, uh, just below the clouds, but in normal weather, you just can see the city, 10 million city below. Right, so this is combination between pale green and pale blue color. So also very subtle. So during the post-processing of this image, I brought the saturation of uh, both blue and uh, green tones down. Uh, maybe on the normal screen, not on the projector, you can also see a little bit of uh, kind of orange tone here, but also try to get the saturation of the orange even more. It was autumn colors. So I decided to put down the orange and yellow completely to have analogous combination. Combination between subtle green and subtle blue. Another great combination that I really like, it's between magenta and blue. So probably on most of my images, uh, you'll see the shift to magenta. So that's why I really like when the sky is uh, not just screaming blue color, like cyan color, not without, not with uh, some yellow tint as well, but uh, shifting it to magenta. Why again? Because uh, just pink color of sunset or sunrise, it actually corresponds very well with this magenta color. So of course, originally uh, the image was much more blue. It was shot uh, just after the sunset with just remains of uh, the pink color. So this is Sumba Island uh, dancing mangrove trees. A mangrove trees, I've never seen such mangrove trees in the world uh, which look like a dancers, actually. And there are so many of them there, and it's absolutely endless place for different compositions when they interact together. You can just make the symmetrical composition when you place a tree in the middle, like this. A little bit green color here, so green color, it actually can make it already not analogous, but still, of course, it's just a little bit of uh, green here. Another image, analogous combination, the same color. Yeah? And here is also image from Greenland, a beautiful iceberg. I see the guy here, he looks like he's sitting and praying, <laughs> looking in the moon and uh, looking on the iceberg. Just love the shape. But we're talking about color, yes, and the color is the transition, is Alpine Glow or Venus of Belt, it's called, yes? When the sun is set, just after the sunset, if atmosphere is clear, if it's very cold, you can see this alpine glow. In the mountains, especially if you have this white color just against the gradient, the alpine glow, you take the telephoto lens, you take the long lens, and you capture this beautiful transition. Again, it was just after the sunset, so the moon was rising, the full moon, and we positioned our sailing boat so we can use 400 millimeter lens to capture the moon just above the iceberg. And you can see, yeah, analogous combination. Very natural, yeah, it's just how the nature works. Yeah, it's very smooth transition. It's very good illustration to analogous combination between the deep uh, kind of blue, magenta, to the pink. Mm? And the color wheel, they stay very close together. Next, next color combination is uh, called uh, 
complementary. Complementary color scheme. So when you have opposite colors, let's say like red and green opposite, or orange and blue. One of my most favorite color schemes. Why? Because uh, it's relatively easy as well, like analogous. It's uh, quite uh, easy to manage it. And again, it's about desaturating some other colors. If you have any other colors uh, you see from the color wheel, you just desaturate them and bring out orange and blue like this. So let's see the practical example. It's from uh, Bali. It's one beautiful remote waterfall in the north of Bali. And very clear combination, complementary one. Red color of the plants and green color of the surrounding. So it, it was quite natural uh, when I took this picture. So I uh, didn't do much of uh, color correction here. Just initially, the image was like this. Just what I needed to do here, a few things also about techniques, how each image was taken. Uh, here it's a vertical panorama, not just a single shot, but basically two shots uh, taken horizontally and then stitched together as a panorama. Of course, it's a slow shutter speed, about one-tenth of a second, so you can see like uh, threads of the water, very silkish kind of lines. Uh, here, also needed to say a little bit about the water, the white color. Sometimes it's worth having some neutral color, like a fluffy white color in your scenes, like this, waterfalls and maybe some streams and creeks. If you try to tone the image in particular color, like blue or orange color, most probably the whole image will be look like toned and uh, there will be no sense of freshness. So this, like, when you look at this image, it may be, uh, you feel this freshness of the water, of the waterfall, yeah? And this is why uh, I've chosen the white color. In uh, Lightroom and Photoshop, when you're editing, it's very easy to just uh, take the pick tool and neutralize. So take the neutral target from the water. That, this is how you get the neutral waterfall, the white, pure color. Another complementary combination between emerald green and a bit of magenta in the sky. One of my most favorite combinations. You can see it throughout many images of sunsets, sunrises uh, during the summertime. Like, right? We have a lot of green, but initially this image, it had quite a lot of yellow color. So the plants here and the grass, uh, the hue was shifted a little bit towards yellow initially. So what I did, I just uh, uh, picked the color and shifted a little bit towards emerald color, like a bit towards uh, more blue tones. And for the sky, again, of course, initial image, I couldn't see much of the pink. So it was just uh, bringing the pink color from the sky, the magenta color here. And uh, again, the purple skies, just do not overdo your images. Do not overburn them. If you apply too much pink, the image will look more like a kitsch. Yes, so a lot of uh, colors, nothing to concentrate still quite soft, quite pale colors, magenta plus emerald here. Same, yeah, you see the color of the land, a bit of uh, green emerald and just a little subtle magenta, it's enough. The sky, of course, it was gray, almost gray. It was a sunset, very subtle light here, but even adding just a little bit of magenta color in the sky, a bit of pink color, it all already creates this kind of game between colors. Yeah, it's a kind of game changer for this image. Not just pure green and uh, uh, dull blue color, but already a much more interesting combination here. Mongolian eagle hunters. Now this is actually Kazakh guys uh, running with the uh, golden eagles. This is uh, west of Mongolia. It's an incredible place. I stayed with these guys for a couple of weeks. Uh, just in a guest uh, uh, tent, they put a tent for me, so I slept in the, in the gear tent and uh, every day documented their life and their ceremonies. And of course they make kind of festival here for my group there as well. And they were running, they were having some fun with golden eagles. And here is the color combination again. Yeah, you can see the pale blue color and a little bit of a kind of orange color, brown color. 
Again, complementary combination. You remember, yes, the color wheel. Just go back. Exactly same combination, yeah? Like here, pale blue color here and pale orange color. Just these two colors. Let's come back. So this is what I did uh, during post-processing of this image. Uh, again, the sky was a little bit gray. It was dark. It didn't even contain uh, blue color. So this is how I just shifted a little bit the top of the image to pale blue color. Sometimes you just need to add a little bit plus, plus five, plus four of the blue, and uh, then you get really nice combination between this pale brown and uh, the blue. Uh, the brown was a uh, little bit more yellow color, but here I just desaturated it a bit and uh, also shifted a little bit towards uh, uh, kind of brownish orange color as well, just to get this combination, the complementary combination. The same, yeah, you see? Pale brown color here and the blue color of the sky also works very well. The same combination. Yeah. Mount Fuji, Fuji Sun. <laughs> See this funny hat? This is a lenticular cloud. It looks really like a hat on top. We were just uh, lucky to see it. Uh, sunset light. From one hand, it, uh, uh, when we just come there, it uh, felt a little bit flat. The light was from behind, and the whole mountain was just uh, overexposed, and it was very, very bright at a certain moment. But when the sun almost hit the mountains behind, just very subtle light. It was a very nice transition. So I just emphasized attention on uh, this nice color combination between pale blue and uh, again a little bit uh, kind of uh, orange red color. Patagonia, beautiful Torres del Paine mountain. Mountains, uh, to make this picture, to make this color combination, complementary color combination, it also helps a lot to use the polarizer. Yeah, what polarizer does, it uh, makes the sky darker. And here the sun was from the right side, 90 degrees from me. That means when I look at the mountains, I can use polarizer and darken the sky. So dark blue color with just a little patch of the brown here and here already makes the beautiful, beautiful complementary combination. A bit of editing, like increasing the contrast for the sky, and taking care of, of these little patches of uh, the light. And here is quite a simple image, just reflection, but uh, quite a powerful one. Split complementary. A little bit more challenging, harder than usually. Split complementary, what does it mean? Actually, it's uh, uh, what happens when you take the complementary one, and one of the colors you just split together like this. So in this case, complementary colors, this is green and yellow. These are complementary colors. Uh, basically, uh, these are complementary colors, yeah? So uh, magenta and was uh, and green color. And we just split the green color like this in uh, two spots. A little bit uh, uh, more difficult already. You already three colors, but probably looks like this. This is Senia Island in Norway, and you already can see uh, pink color, magenta, and green. Yeah? So split complementary colors. Again, look at the wheel here. We can see green color. So this is magenta here, and uh, the yellow color. Yes, a bit of uh, yellowish color here. So I left specifically this part here and this part with yellow color. Senia Island. Another example here, again the blue color, bit of uh, kind of red uh, color here, and the green. Uh, this is a very special place, it's uh, Lauca National Park in the northern Chile region. Super remote place. These two mountains, they called Piachatas, the brothers, twins. And this place is located on elevation about uh, 4,000 meters or so. It's a very high place, yeah? I just uh, also waited for this nice uh, time when we have this uh, alpine glow above volcanoes. Monochromatic, super easy color combination, very easy to understand. 
just you can uh, take only one color. So uh, there are a few ways uh, achieving nachromatic. Uh, basically, you can either shoot in some overcast weather, yeah, or you can uh, post-process your images. Just saturate everything completely, bring only one tone, and you get images like this, yeah? This is post-processing mostly, how I bring the monochromatic color just red, Japan. Yeah, it's in Kyoto, and uh, Daigaji Temple north of Kyoto. Autumn color is in November. So how I achieved only one color, I actually had uh, quite a lot of other colors. You can notice that uh, there are trees here, and they were green. Moss and some trees, so I just uh, taken Separately, I will show you how to do it later in practical examples. But uh, I just uh, took the green color and desaturated almost to zero. So this is how only the red color left. The blue color, perfect for Arctic. So I spent quite a lot of time in Greenland, in uh, Antarctica. And uh, basically, almost initially, when you take pictures of icebergs of ice, it's just some tones of blue again. Uh, you see that uh, most of the images, it's not screaming, it's not saturated color, they quite uh, uh, put down in saturation. So most of the cases, I even need to desaturate some parts of the image. Ice caves, ice caves of uh, Kamchatka, so this is far east of Russia. And uh, these ice caves, they're actually under active volcanoes. So this is the land of active volcanoes, and just under the volcano, there are some ancient glaciers, and rivers going like this through the, uh, through the glacier and they're cutting these tunnels in the ice. So this is how you can go inside the tunnel and uh, it was in summertime and you can see even water dipping from the ceiling. So it's actually melting. A little bit dangerous business to go there in summertime because sometimes they're collapsing this case. But again, it's a color combination here is monochromatic. Just blue colors. Long exposure, about 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Just ask my friend to stay there still, like this, to show the scale uh, of the cave itself. Again, the same cave, just a different place, but again, just shades of blue, shades of blue color. Initially, when I took this image, it was almost black and white. Not much of the light, not much of the color, but I just took it and toned it with blue color in post-processing. North Ural Mountains, Russia, again. So just uh, my friend was walking there among the snow giants. These are uh, big rocks and they all covered with a large amount of snow in winter. Just some extreme expedition to North Urals with, with minus 35, minus 30 Celsius. Again, monochrome. Again, this image is toned. So originally just almost black and white. Uh, almost no color, just added a little bit more color during post-processing. It was, uh, uh, it's quite famous composition actually, but by uh, Franz Lasting in Namibia. Probably some of you saw this composition. These are uh, dead trees of uh, Sosus Flay, almost uh, like a stone already, yeah? fossil trees. And also one color, orange. You can see, basically there is just a couple of minutes when you can take this picture, when the light just hits the edge between the pan, between uh, the ground and the dunes, you can see the actually shadow starting to go down. This is how you see these trees a bit uh, tricky, like like a shadows uh, on the dune uh, background. Yeah. Next uh, color combinations, it's uh, triadic. It's uh, almost the same, like split complementary. Almost the same, just uh, the colors, uh, they like, they more split like this. Sometimes uh, people mix it, it doesn't really uh, affect your images in some way, just very similar to split complementary. Okay, let's see some examples here. So again, have a look. A bit of magenta, a bit of green, and also I added a little bit more red here and still green over here, so have a look. Yeah, so we have red color, we have green color, and blue. So the blue sky, I left green color of the trees, yeah, and uh, the blue color of the sky. 
the next one is also South Korea again the same idea so I left the green color we have red color and the blue color of the sky yeah post-processing of this image it uh, included quite uh, quite a work with the red color so when I first initially took the picture again it's a blue hour just uh, before the actual sunrise the sunrise was there and I took uh, a few panoramas uh, before the sunrise and after the sunrise. So when the sun uh, was rising, I was quite happy and ah, it's so beautiful. The fog was lit up and everything. But then I started to choose the images and found out when the sun is actually, it's already rise here, then I have the light here in the foreground. So the image, it has too many details. So it, the color combination was actually killed. I have already the yellow color and some white out spaces here on the foreground on the tree. So eventually, yeah, I decided to take this blue hour image just before the actual sunrise. And this is how I bring this uh, color combination, red color, green, and blue. Here we go. Another picture from South Korea, the same story. Yeah, absolutely the same colors, color combination. Little bit different thing here, here's the yellow, green and blue color. Again, let's have a look on the wheel, color wheel. So the yellow color somewhere here, the green color of the plants here, and the blue color, I left the blue color of the sky. So typical, actually quite typical color combination for sunrise or sunset. Yeah, when we have already a little patch of the blue sky, then clouds are still orange, they're still yellow, and we have some summer leaves and uh, summer plants. Quadratic color combination. Huh? Things are going to be more complicated, yeah, a little bit more tricky. Color combinations here. Basically, a uh, quadratic color combination is uh, just two complementary colors. Yeah? Complementary complementary like we studied already we studied magenta and emerald and yeah, some images from Norway from Senia and red and green like from Bali from this waterfall image from Bali that's the image from Patagonia yes yeah, so let's try to find the uh, uh, quadratic combination here so again looking uh, here maybe some cyan color and red color yeah so we found the uh, uh, red color here, somewhere here, yes, and Kian. So this is the one complementary, wait, yes, next one. And uh, another complementary, the blue and the yellow color of the flowers. So two complementary colors playing together. That's why when I thought about this image, I thought, aha, uh -huh, what to do with the flowers here? So should I shift the color maybe a little bit towards orange color or should I desaturate? But yeah, I still decided to leave it. I still decided to leave the yellow color and the blue color still quite saturated, the blue color of the sky. So that's uh, Torres del Paine and Patagonia again. The Senia Island from Norway, again, quite a similar story. I just left a little patch of uh, the yellow color, of the orange color, so it will be quite a similar combination. Again, the blue, magenta, so magenta green, and yellow blue. So for this, Processing of this image, I specifically brought a little bit more blue color of the fjord. Yeah, so this is how it works. The blue color and yellow, complementary. And the green color and magenta. So the green over here and kind of magenta color of the sky. So initially this image, it had a lot of gray color of the sky. So I brought out the magenta color of the sky and I brought blue color of the fjord. So this combination, color combination worked. Quite a lot of autumn colors here, but uh, pretty much uh, the same story, yeah? Yeah. The other color combination is when uh, uh, you start, you remember analogous, yeah, the first one, when we had colors close by, like maybe the, the blue one and the magenta, yeah, from Sumba Island, dancing mangrove trees, and then you start splitting it like this. So you start splitting and uh, having colors like this, the blue color, of the sky and red color of uh, autumn leaves. Blue color here, red color here. 
same story, almost same place, Mount Fujisan. Similar story, Baikal Lake, Siberia. A bit of uh, the orange color here and the blue color of the foreground of the ice. So sp split like this. And uh, yeah, this is the part about uh, the color wheel and color combinations. But I should say, you guys, that uh, this is not something that you must be just stick to, do not uh, just overload your brain with this. Sometimes it's all about kind of training your eye. Yes, and sometimes these are not just rules. Yes, sometimes you can step out of uh, the theory, step out of the rules and be more creative. The most essential thing that uh, you must keep your colors, in landscape images, natural, believable. They can be magical, but keep it real. And uh, uh, what also helps to, for beginners, if we talk about color wheel, uh, you can actually print out the color wheel just uh, on a paper, on, or there are even some kind of books or booklets with a color wheel. And while you process the images, especially in the beginning, sometimes you just put it next to your laptop, next to your monitor, and just have a look uh, on the colors, so how they actually work out uh, with your images. So again, color palette it helps to bring most essential thing in composition and bring back the destructive things, making your images more clear and powerful. And I've chosen this background image from Bolivia, from Uyuni Salt Flats, for this reason to show you. Yeah, it's just I had a lot of light pollution from Uyuni village, so Uyuni was here, and it was uh, quite a lot of yellow color on, of the sky here. A lot of light pollution, and uh, this kind of dirty yellow orange color, it didn't fit. Uh, the mood of the night. So I decided to desaturate uh, the yellow almost completely and bring the image monochromic. Just blue colors and very subtle colors, magenta colors uh, of the Milky Way. So this is how I uh, brought the idea quite clear. Just simple idea, the arch of the Milky Way. And this is actually a selfie I was running from my camera and uh, staying back with the headlamp. Just very simple uh, composition, but uh, still, this is a power in simplicity of landscapes. And you recall, yeah, I uh, talked uh, about uh, Goethe. Goethe always uh, just uh, he, he always uh, emphasized the attention on um, uh, kind of empathy, on kind of uh, emotional aspect of uh, color in paintings in art. And uh, in other words, Goethe told us that colors uh, uh, they actually depended a lot also on uh, luminosity level around and emotional values and surrounding colors. So not like Newton, uh, just pure scientific approach to colors. And this is the image I told you about in the beginning, yeah, when we shoot it. And uh, I processed, I was warm myself. And I processed it in very uh, warm tones. But half of the group, they just desaturated the orange here and brought it completely blue and white, which is also very beautiful. It uh, just shows you the cold temperatures, the just mood of the cold Iceland. All right, and uh, another quite essential person to mention about, it's uh, Roger de Pils, who kind of uh, invited, uh, um, invented um, palette from uh, eight colors. And he also emphasized uh, that the color is essentially connected to light and shadows. So the color, it uh, uh, cannot exist just on its own, but it's uh, literally connected to the luminosity level, to the light and shadows level and balance in your images. And uh, this is a few words here about uh, colors practical things already. Yeah, we're moving a little bit towards our practice in Photoshop and Lightroom. So this is uh, how kind of one-dimensional color palette looks like, yeah, here. And this is the level of brightness. So if we combine together all the colors, all the hues and luminosity level here, then we receive this kind of diagram. 
So what does it mean? This is a brightness level here from blacks to whites, like this, a gradation. And this is a different colors. And the thing that you can notice at first place about very saturated colors. So where you can find them? Let's say we, we check the blue, yeah? Where is the most saturated blue color? It's somewhere around here. It's a quite dark place. And what about the yellow? Where is the most saturated yellow, the cleanest, the purest yellow color? It's somewhere up here. So you see, yeah, you can almost draw the line like this here. The line of the most saturated, the purest colors. And there are different colors, uh, different models of the colors. So uh, just I will not uh, torture you with different models. Just to mention that in Photoshop, you can see kind of slice of this pie. Yeah, HSB model. When you go to Photoshop, you can find hue, saturation, and brightness and navigate through them. This is the most saturated color. Yeah, where, where you can find it. You can find it right at the edge of this cone here. And the brightness level from dark to bright color. So this is the slice. We take it and we have it here in Photoshop when we're managing colors, when we're managing curves, the actual tools we're using for post-processing the model. This is what I'm telling about. The purest color is the colors of the mid-tones, probably with a level of uh, brightness from about 10 to 70. This is 100%, yeah, from zero to 100, about 10 to 70. This is the line of the purest of the uh, kind of colors of mid-tones where you can actually work, where, you, where uh, we see them. And if we take the colors above, these are very pale, very gentle colors really hard to manage them. And this is the level here where we almost uh, can't see, where we can't feel the colors. This is kind of three-dimensional model uh, of uh, lab colors. Lab is uh, uh, when you separate uh, the lightness, the luminance, the level of luminance from the actual color. And here it's worth also mentioning the color space. Sometimes it's very confusing for photographers which color space to use. There are a few of them. And of course, most known uh, is a RGB color, Adobe RGB and Profoto. So let's discuss what is the difference between the color spaces and which color space you need to use in which situation. So this is kind of representation of the general model of the colors we can see. As a human beings, we can see these colors. And what's the difference between models? Yeah, you can see here on slides, I just quickly explain you. RGB model, sRGB, it's probably the simplest one we're using. You can see just the saturated green color, the saturated blue color, it's almost cut. Adobe RGB, little bit more coverage. And Profot RGB, it's so much color, it actually goes out of the gamut, of the diagram, gamut diagram. Which color space we must use as photographers? Basically, what I do myself, I edit images in Profota. I convert them during uh, raw file processing into Profota color space, edit in Profota, and then if I need to publish the images, I publish them in RGB. So why? It's working like this because most of devices we have, like smartphones and all the laptops, they're able to show only this, only this very limited amount of colors. So what happens if somehow you forgot to uh, change the color, uh, the uh, color space into RGB and you publish the image, you look and it looks very gray. On social networks, on websites, yeah, the thing is that you need to check. Yeah, if you change the color space while exporting the image for social networks and for publishing on the net. If you're printing the images, normally I convert to Adobe RGB because Profoto RGB is uh, too ideal. This color space is too ideal. And uh, even printers, even modern devices, they just not able to uh, produce these colors on the device or on the paper, right? So Adobe RGB for printing images. Most uh, 
qualified labs, uh, they can, of course, they can export in Adobe RGB themselves. But why I'm editing in Profoto, so maybe in the future will be more ideal devices that will be able to print uh, this super saturated green and uh, uh, blue color. So basically going for ideal, most out that I can take during post-processing. And also make sure if you're processing the images that it's uh, not in 8-bit depth. Yeah, it's always in 16-bit. sRGB, it's most probably, it's 8-bit JPEG. So you're losing a lot of quality in your images. And very specific uh, color spaces, I will not uh, emphasize on them. Basically, SMYK, uh, mostly designers using it. It's uh, not much used for photography. And lab. Lab is quite interesting color space, by the way. Sometimes I'm using it when you separate the lightness level, the luminous level, of, uh, from the actual color. Little bit tricky color space because it doesn't uh, work the same way like we see. Yeah, so you're separating uh, lightness level from the actual saturation. But helps a lot when you need to uh, bring saturation down or up uh, without affecting the colors directly. So this, this is the actual uh, part here about post-processing. I think we have a little bit uh, more time on the theory like about five, 10 minutes, I can ask some, uh, I can answer some of your questions. So if you want, you can ask questions about the theory right now. So we will discuss it. And then after the break at 6.15, I will move to post-processing part. So any questions, guys? No questions yet. All right. Yes. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I try to understand and uh, study the color. Yeah, I yes? I yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I understand because I see the photo and I can at least understand the <laughs> But yeah, I mean, in the end, you want to tell us to take the photo, but mm -hmm. to play about the color theory. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, this, yeah, this lecture, I am uh, emphasized specifically on colors, yes, it's uh, maybe one of the most trickiest uh, things for landscape photographer. And uh, I actually don't think about uh, the color when I'm there in this in the scene, when I'm actually shooting landscape, when I'm making landscape images. I do not uh, just think a lot about color. I just. Uh, yeah. Yeah, when I'm there in the fields, I mostly uh, think about how I compose the image and uh, just play with different uh, conditions. Basically, uh, shoot the sunset, sunrise, maybe some details. And then when I'm back home, when I'm post-processing the image, so this is where the game is actually happening. So this is where you can twi twist these colors, they, you can tweak them, yeah, it's just in a different way. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, please. Oh, very good question uh, about printing. Uh, when printing, I'm trying to go to the lab myself. So not just sending the images to the lab and then receiving some dark print or different colors. So I'm going myself to the lab and uh, making the probes, the print probes. So first you uh, make a little image. And ah, I'm not happy with colors. We need to change this a little bit and then adjust a little bit the picture. And then you try again and again, and maybe after a few probes, you're happy with the result. But anyway, it's just the method of uh, trials and tries like this. It's uh, almost impossible if you print your first images 
almost impossible to get there to the right color. And uh, also about, uh, it's also about how you calibrate your screens, yeah? I really suggest you, if you're working professionally with color, really suggest you to take a calibration system like Spider, yeah, so Color Monkey, and uh, calibrate your screen depending on uh, like outside conditions you have, like how much light you have. Sometimes it happens to me that I can be quite tired. I come in the evening to my room and uh, try to post-process quickly the image, post it straight away, and I feel really tired at this time. And then in the morning I wake up and see what I've done, and ah, I'm in shock. <laughs> so I need to rebuild everything again. Because I was tired, and uh, uh, I actually uh, just couldn't hold myself to just make good colors. And uh, also the room was dark, maybe I switched off the light, so it depends also on the conditions you are in yourself, and the light conditions uh, you have in the room, in the, uh, in the apartment. So I always uh, call it uh, the night check. So the night is checking you. Sometimes you need to rebuild ev everything from zero. And when I'm uh, processing images in different colors, if I already build the image, if I processed it, uh, and I don't like it, it's better to start from the zero, from the very beginning. It's uh, how it works. It's not possible. If you don't like the colors, it's almost not possible to change the final result. You need to start from the beginning and uh, get the result again. Uh, I still have a, uh, it's better to do it actually in the evening for me personally, when I have no, no reflections from the screen. Spe I specifically have, uh, when I'm back at home, I have a cover for my screen, so it's quite dark, and I don't put uh, my screen in front of the window, so it's in a dark corner. And I even have a special, like, I'm darkening uh, my room, just putting the curtains on, so I will, have, I will be in the dark room myself, but still keeping the light like this level here in this room. So still not pitch black, because what happens if you have kind of pitch black situation around you? What happens, you tend to see the image very bright, and then if you print it uh, in the lab, the image will look dark. Because you see it from the screen, it's like shining, it's super bright, your eyes get used to it. So it uh, feels like it's already bright. Yeah, but when you take it from the lab, it feels uh, super dark. So this is a common mistake if you process it in uh, dark conditions. And also, another trick uh, I have, uh, I try to calm my eyesight on the green color. So let's say if you have some plants at home, or if you can look outside from time to time. So you process one image, then you go to the window, and for about a couple of minutes, you're just looking to some green color outside. For this reason, I also have a lot of green plants in my house. So just looking in, in the green and calm down my eyesight. Because your eyes get used to particular color conditions, light conditions. Any other questions? The, the picture set actually showed us the, the, uh, the amount of color that you can film in Japan. Mm -hmm. Yes, and actually plan to show it to you on a yeah. practical processing workshop, so we'll see it for sure. Right. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, I just want to add something. Uh, do you have any uh, preferred tools, any tools that you use to process images? Because I know that there are some uh, The factors? Yeah, I think I have quite favorite color combinations. Yeah, so I think every photographer, it, uh, he must have his uh, own style. So images must be recognizable, especially where there are so many photographers outside. And sometimes I see particular image in my Instagram feed, and I already know without even uh, looking in description that this photographer made this image. And why I know this? Because of these favorite combinations. Maybe some of people using more like yellowish colors and darker mood colors, but I prefer to use um, uh, magenta and green, for example, one of my favorite combination. The blue color and a uh, bit of pink color. So trying to shift the color towards my favorite ones. And I think photographers must uh, do it to distingu distinguish the style and works from others. Yes. 
Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, when I use? Yeah. That's fine. Uh, good question also. Uh, let me try to find some particular example to show you. Let's see. This image. It's almost entirely made with lab color. Why? Because I didn't want to saturate colors in the sky. And I didn't want to saturate color, even colors on the mountains here. So I just took the L channel lightness, create a curve there with contrast, and uh, this is most, uh, mostly, that's it. So this essential part of post-processing. The lightness, if you just uh, tweak the lightness, it doesn't affect the color. The saturation stays the same. Because what you can do, let's say, with curves, when you post-process your images, you create the contrast. And the contrast, it increases the saturation. And sometimes I need to do the opposite. Yeah, I need to increase the saturation. But I'm not doing this directly, just uh, using the saturation of vibrant sliders. I'm increasing the saturation using curves. And sometimes you must do opposite. Yeah, you uh, don't need to increase the saturation, but keep it on a very low level like this. So this is typical image when you need a pale blue sky, dark blue sky, but you don't want to be saturated. So you want to keep the saturation calm down like this. Yes. Now with your experience taking a lot of lab photography, do you, uh, when on location, mm -hmm. when you're taking the photos, do you already have a, a vision of how the post-processing is going to be? Or do you mm. discover on the spot? Nice question also, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think in most of the cases, uh, I still don't know how I process it. I just don't think about that. I'm just taking this moment uh, for myself, just trying to find the composition, not to miss the light. And yeah, this is the part where you do mostly in uh, post-processing. But still, again, when you post-process images, then you uh, remember actually your feelings there, right? Like with this yeah. Icelandic image. Yeah. So sometimes uh, uh, there's different approach among landscape photographers. Some, they keep images for a long time in the archives before they actually uh, get to them. It's like a good wine you know, in the cellar. You just, yeah. yeah, but personally, I really like to process images almost right after I made them. While my feelings, while my emotions about this image, they're still uh, fresh. While I still remember how I felt there and uh, uh, what idea I must bring. But again, while I'm shooting there, I'm mostly thinking about uh, catching the light itself and uh, building some strong composition themselves. And then uh, all the tweaks that happen later. Any other questions? The time, yes? Break. All right, guys, so what we're going to do, we will have 15 minutes break, yes, and then We'll go to Photoshop, Lightroom, to some post-processing practice, right? Perfect. filters on your lenses here or you don't recommend to use them? Yeah, I use them a lot actually. So um, out of these photos, uh, how mm -hmm. many were without ND filter? Oh, I think in this selection maybe most of them without filters. Without filters. Yeah, because it's very specific. You use them mostly for seascapes. Uh, what about the waterfall uh, shots? Were without ND filters? Also? Yeah, this one without ND because it was quite dark. They are dark conditions. Okay. Basically, it depends a lot on uh, the trip you're going. If you're going to shoot seascape, like in Iceland or Norway, you don't need 
No, you need the filters need. there. Yeah, of course, if you stay at the sea and you want to play with waves breaking and just receding and breaking, and you want some smooth lines of the water, then you need NDs. Is too much no, it's mostly about building uh, nice lines of the water. So imagine if you have some, maybe I, I will find some practical images to show you. Let me try to find, maybe in previews, some ND images. Yeah, like this. So this image is, uh, was taken with ND filter. How many stops? Ten? Uh, this is uh, three stops. Three stops ND. So you see that uh, the waves, they actually have smooth shape, like this. They have smooth shapes. What happens if you're not using ND filter? Then you have splashes, all the little drops, and uh, they're quite destructive. Yeah, so you have lots of ripples and uh, some water drops. But uh, some photographers uh, who are keen to make minimalist style images, they also making images like this when you have very still water. Maybe not the best example, but of minimal style, like single trees and smoothed water. Then they're using ND10 stop filters. Do you intend to separate the foreground and the background on the, when you do the coloring? Because I notice on the, um, on the digital shots where you have mm -hmm. the trees and the shadow, there is a horizontal line which separates even the falcon shot mm -hmm. where you have uh, the three people on the horses, mm -hmm. the background is completely has different lighting from the foreground. Uh, yeah, 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 that's all right. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I'll just press it, okay. <laughs> all right.
Hello. Welcome back, everyone. So now it uh, will be a little bit more practical part. Yeah, we uh, talked a bit about theory, and now it will be practice. So I will show you uh, how I manage actually manage colors in practice. So let me open uh, Lightroom and Photoshop. So now I will import images I prepared for you guys. So just uh, a few examples of uh, different images. I plan to uh, tweak them a little bit to get to this color combinations I've shown to you. And uh, yes, so these are the images. Lightroom is here, ready to import. Just drag and drop them. Here we are. Everyone is back. Yeah, I see. Cool. So we all have different level of post-processing, definitely. And what I'm going to show you today, we have about one hour, maybe even less. What time should we finish? Yeah, one hour. One hour, yeah, perfect. So of course, in one hour, it's almost impossible to show absolutely everything. Uh, but I will show you my best tips and tricks, so basically try to pass you my brains for a while, how I'm thinking about the images, how I'm planning it, what processing. So it's always all about ideas. And before rushing into post-processing, I actually try to speak to the image. Like I'm not mad, but <laughs> I'm not speaking, talking to my images, but, but by what I mean is uh, trying to imagine understand how the image might look like after I post-process it. Here is a <laughs> quite dark raw file. And here is the image with horses you've seen. It's also quite dark, just silhouettes. You remember this one, yeah? And this is what we're going to do, guys. So I'm going to show you my post-processing tips and tricks, my key, things that I'm implementing and processing. Different level of processing for everyone, so we will talk about both Lightroom and Photoshop. Maybe some simple things, and then maybe a little bit more complicated. So if it's, it's complicated for you, just write down, maybe you can use your phone to record as well, and uh, later try to apply it to your images as well. But again, first of all, everything starting, not rushing into some parameters, uh, just increasing exposure, saturation, making some crazy FDR image. Everything starts from a plan. So you must imagine, you must talk to the image. What you like about it and what you don't like. Your job, your purpose and goal as a photographer is trying to find, trying to emphasize on one key idea. So bring the things you like about the image and conceal things, remove things that you don't like. So here, I'm trying to talk with this picture, yes? I'm trying to understand, of course, I see horses, they're running, they were like angels, like Pegasus running on the water. So first thing I want to do, I want to make it in kind of high key and a bright key. So I want to light it up. So the horses will be bright and I still have details of the sky. And I don't really like the rider here. So this is how it works. The rider, he runs close to horses and this is how they run like a hair, like a, a hair together, all together. But I don't really like when uh, the rider here is he's with a stick. It's uh, something that uh, distracts me. I don't really like that horses, they have this black silhouette here. But I like this image. I selected it because of the color in the sky, because of this little even sunburst. And this is a situation I can't use bracketing. It's action. Definitely, I can't use it. That's why it's a single image parameter, as you can see here. It's f13 one divided by 800 and ISO 320. So how we process this picture? Rega regarding the colors, uh, the colors uh, here are analogous. The first one, you remember, the color wheel, colors are close together. The yellow, orange, brown, golden colors. So the first thing I'm going to do here, just Increase exposure, 
like this. I'm trying to understand if I can bring more details from horses. And definitely I start losing the sky here. So I will decrease highlights and whites. But that's the problem when you do it like this in uh, Lightroom during your post-processing. Sometimes you can create a kind of HDR image. There's too much details. And my advice to you is uh, do not do much of the HDR. Yeah, so when you decrease highlights and whites quite a lot, you increase exposure, shadows, the image can become very flat. Maybe it's not the classical landscape, yeah, but in general, if you're killing highlights and whites, your image becomes flat. So I see lots of people now rushing there, running for technical thing about landscape, other than creating, uh, emphasizing on a certain details and a certain colors. You remember the painting by Caravaggio? It's all black, yes, and all just little details they lit up with the shadow. So we have something to learn from painters, yeah? And here it's a little bit different case, yeah? So here I want to create a high key image. This way I can increase exposure even more like this and uh, bring this brightness to the image. And you can see the color. This is yellow color. You remember that uh, on this diagram, when I was showing you different colors, the yellow one, the most purest, the, the, the purest, the saturated color, the yellow was super bright. So what happens if you just use normal exposure, zero, the yellow becomes very dirty, it's brown-like color. So it's really far away from the pure yellow, pure golden color. So this is why I decided to bright up the image and create the high key other than having just the silhouettes of the image. So this is it. Yeah, very bright image. And still I want to save details from the sky. This is why I'm creating gradients like this, putting it here and decreasing wi whites and highlights to bring details from the sky. Next, if you're using just Lightroom, you can create kind of magic feel if you actually decrease the haze. So it creates kind of softness, soft effect, like this. And the clarity, if you're adding too much clarity, you see the image becomes quite dirty, this one with high key. So decrease the clarity, probably put also about minus five, minus 10. And the texture, we can actually add a little bit more texture opposite, yeah, to have details of the water. Then the curves, yeah, this is the way how I edit most of my images with curves. So what you can see here, this is the histogram of the image. You can see the histogram here on the right. If you're not familiar with that, basically I have whites here, mid-tones, and blacks. And now I added a, lo a lot of exposure and most of the histogram, most of the pixels, they lay here in the whites and very bright part of the image. So this is what's happening. Later we will have different examples and I will show you how I'll also soften the image using the curve. Another trick in Lightroom. But here, just make sure you have a point curve so you can add a point and just rise the curve like this in mid-tones. So this is also the way of uh, creating softness. White point can go down. Again, I'm trying not to exceed the contrast and save more details from the brights. Always look on your histogram. Even when you're shooting, of course, when horses are running, it's not possible to uh, track everything, but still, it's possible to make a test shot before they actually run and uh, make sure that you're not overexposing. Always keep an eye on the histogram and keep some space so you're not overexposing uh, details here. So this is how we manage it. Later, uh, we will move some images to Photoshop and I will also show you how to remove unwanted things, how to remove the rider from here. So in the final image, you couldn't see him, so we can actually remove him, although not that easy work to do. 
So this is the picture. It was uh, quite easy one. Analogous color combination. We can check another one here. This is what I mentioned when I talked about similar picture. It was some cropping thing here. Some vertical image from Faroe Islands. You almost can't see magenta in the sky. It's just gray. But again, you can uh, make complementary combination. You can have the emerald color and magenta color. So this is what I'm going to do. Again, I'm checking if I see something destructive. So probably some poles here and a little village there. So I will crop the image just to eliminate destruction and uh, just push it a little bit from below as well. Maybe twist a little bit, rotate the horizon. Just a little crop and then how I separate the colors. Yep, so I will create a gradient. Let's go to the gradient filter and I will put a gradient from above. And definitely I have uh, quite a lot of white. Again, you look at the histogram and it's almost there, but still no over, not overexposed. If you see the pitch going up like this, the big slope, then it means the picture is overexposed. But here I just, just uh, make less exposure and make a bit less highlights and whites like this. And you can already see that some color starting to go through, a little bit of pink color, a bit uh, more color in the blue. And you remember again this diagram. Yeah, we were talking about yellow color, but the blue color, it was the most, the lowest one. Yeah, so the saturated blue color, it lays down below this white. First thing that I did with image, it was not the basic settings and anything, but just to understand which details I have in the sky. But if I use just this gradient, the sky can become a little bit dirty, a little bit uh, heavy and dark. So please be also very careful with the sky like this. So I'm trying to balance the exposure a bit and balance highlights and whites. And what also happens that when I put gradients like this, I also have the mountain quite dark. The mountain becomes black here and here dark. So the thing I will do is I will use the range mask. In the recent versions of Lightroom, there is a range mask which helps quickly to separate the land, the mountains from the bright sky. So let's create the luminance, range mask. I will see it and then I will change the range. You can see what's happening. Yeah, I'm cutting the blacks. So the range starts from the blacks to the whites. So if you want to cut the blacks and apply the gradient only for the sky, not for the land, you're just cutting the range. So it should be somewhere around here. Let's do it again. Let's see how the mask is changing. So we'll cut the range from the blacks. Here we go. And let's tick off the option and see uh, show luminous mask and see how it works. Yeah, you see that the gradient is actually starting to, to be applied only for the sky, avoiding the land. Very simple idea, but for landscape it helps a lot because we normally have the sky, some mountains, some land, maybe buildings, and we need to separate the sky. It was a nice question during the break that uh, uh, how I process the images, yeah, how I separate them. So basically, this is how I do it. First thing, you separate images, separate uh, plans of the images. Background, the sky from the foreground using gradients. There are more complicated uh, techniques in Photoshop, of course. When you move in Photoshop, you can draw the mask, you can draw the luminosity masking uh, layers, uh, but this is far more advanced things, yeah? We probably we'll have some time to discuss it. But this is a simple thing you can do. Then, uh, you remember I talked also about magenta, so I will add more magenta and more blue here, just in the same gradient. So the sky will have this complementary color to the emerald. And then how I tweak the actual colors, maybe shift the hue, because I still see quite a lot of yellow color in the land. It's not uh, emerald. It's yellow and blue. It's not the best color combination. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to HSL in Lightroom. I will find 
the yellow, the yellow and green. And I will try to shift the yellow a little bit towards greens. And even I will try to shift the green towards emerald, like this. Maybe hard to see it in details on projector, but just on the screen I see it very well. And then I can go to luminous. And you remember I just uh, was decreasing highlights and whites in the picture with horses, but here it's quite a scattered light, so the image looks a little bit flat. To avoid it, to bring back this kind of light, I will go to luminance and I will add a little bit more of the greens and yellows, like this. Yes, yeah, so you see even uh, some rooftops, they here they start to shine a little bit with, the, with light. So more luminance on the green, so the image will be more light. To emphasize this, I will use also the gradient tool, radial filter. This time it's not a plain gradient, but this is a radial filter. And I will apply it in the middle, like this, and increase whites. So you see it also helps to emphasize on the middle of the image. So bring out, and you can already see the silhouette of the horse here, it's kind of starting to shine. And this is a good thing, this is a good thing I also learned from uh, paintings, from iconic paintings like classical uh, Trinity by Giotta, yes? When I talked about Uffiz, it's the first painting you see there, the Trinity. And what happens with this iconic painting, you always keep your eyesight into the frame, in the middle. So you're not going out of the frame. And this is how you keep the eyesight here. It's kind of circulating within the frame. So we're keeping the eyesight into things that can draw your eyesight out of the frame. Maybe some buildings uh, on the edges, or if you try to cut the image very close to the actual building like this. If you have this anchor points, most probably they will draw the eyesight out the frame and this is what's ruining the composition but again back to colors so we have now this nice combination of magenta and the sky and green on the bottom complementary color combination then this image yes you can see it's different from what I've shown you yeah so how I process it the image again trying to talk to the picture, what I like, what I don't like. What I actually uh, like here, it's nice composition, reflections here. It was also made with ND filters, yeah? So this is how you see the water without ripples. So it wasn't, it was without, uh, with a little bit of ripples, but using ND six stop filter, I just softened the water. Also it helped, uh, there was some people walking by, passing by on the bridge here in the evening. And using ND filter, it also helps to just get rid of uh, the people passing by. I like the water, I like the red color, but for me, uh, Japan Autumn, it's about red color. It's about deep red color of maple trees. And also this little pavilion here in Daigonji Temple, it also has this red color. So I decided, okay, so maybe I'll just stick to monochromatic composition, uh, monochromatic um, color, yes, and use only one color, red color. So let me go straight to HSL, and I will try to decrease the saturation of any color other than red. So first, that I see that green color is quite destructive here. So I'm going to go to the green, and desaturate the green and aqua, like this, almost minus 100%. Then there is some orange colors on the top. So I'm going to go to the hue and shift the hue. Again, shift towards red. Yeah, already working, but again, not trying not, not to overdo this because if you go to some unreal color like this, this is too much. Keep it real. So if I'm shifting it too much, the image uh, already just loses this uh, way to reality and just the people who will look to the image they 
uh, will say, ah, the picture is not real of the scholars, it doesn't exist. So still keeping in touch with the reality when you process the images. Of course, everyone has his own line where he can go further in processing, but for me, the line is uh, somewhere here, yeah? When the image is still not too pink and uh, not looking like some kitsch, yes? So then what we also can improve, the colors already look quite nice here, almost shifted to red, but I see that we can bring more details from the rooftop and uh, from the trees here. So also I need to increase the contrast. And when I see in the histogram, I see that unlike the horses, the horse image, the histogram is pretty much shifted to the dark, to the blacks. So what I need to do now, I need to soften the blacks. And this is the way I'm doing it. So I'm going to the curve, selecting the black point here, and lifting it up a little bit. It's again, it's not the best to just look only on the projector screen because already projector screen, the colors, they don't have the black point, yeah? But still, this is the trick. Simple and uh, easy to use. You just lift the black point up, maybe 10 to 15 value, and return back the contrast and mid-tones. And I can actually put the points around the edges here, like this. So what just happened, there is the S shape of the curve, classical contrast, but the black point just shifted up a little bit. So it helps to uh, eliminate the effect when you have exceeding contrast and it kills details in shadows. Yeah, so you're just lifting the black point up and you see details in shadows. Sometimes it also helps to go to the blue channel and lift up the blue point like this. So what happens if we do it? We return the whole curve in the middle. We're adding, we're toning the shadows. We're adding a little bit more blue color to the shadow. So it's now a little bit nice game between the cold blue and the red color. But it's so subtle that you can't notice that. So this is the trick, yeah? And the, the curve, it should be not parametric, it should be the point curve. So if you open the Lightroom and you don't know how to change it, you just go here and click to edit the point curve. All right, another image is uh, almost done. One thing I will do, I will create a gradient from the top like this and darken it. So I will darken create less exposure here and probably a little bit less of the highlights. Again, it's uh, for the purpose to keep the eyesight within the frame, just darkening the part here so our eyesight it will not go out to the top of the image. All right, so this image is uh, almost done here. So let me select some other one. Yeah, let's say I can go to one of the variations of the Fuji shot here. Fuji with a hat, a bit later moment here, but you can still see the color of the sunset here. And almost all details from blacks, they're gone, but you still see them over here. So the idea of this uh, processing of this picture might be to bring out the blacks from the trees here and also bring uh, the color from this little cloud. So how I do it, uh, first thing I will also increase the exposure, but increasing exposure, I'm just straight away, I'm overexposing this hat on Mount Fuji. Yes, yeah, so I'll be very careful with that. Decreasing highlights, lights, and trying to play with colors. I still need to open details for the left and the right parts. So for this reason, I'm uh, 
creating the razor filter, moving the radial filter to the right side, increasing exposure. And here I will use the range mask again. So the range mask will be the luminance. And for the luminance, I need to do the opposite thing that I've shown you before. I need to cut brights like this. Let's see the luminance mask. You see, affecting just the trees. So let's go back and try to open shadows a bit more. Try to open blacks a little bit more. Again, creating some soft contrast in blacks. And I will do the same uh, for the left part. So for the left part, uh, I will uh, increase exposure, increase shadows, and increase blacks to get all details. And again, cutting uh, the bright sky. Range mask, luminance, and cutting the bright. Hmm, probably just cutting 75, 80 to 80% 80 like this. Cutting 20% of uh, the bright. Uh, again, we will go to the curves like we did before. Select the black point and try to soften the blacks. So for most of my images, you will not actually find the black point. If you look, all the images, they look very soft for this one reason, because I'm lifting up the black. So it creates kind of velvet uh, look of the image. And then for this shot, I don't need the excessive contrast because I'm trying to add the contrast and then the sky starting to be just blowing out. So I will delete this point, just click uh, delete control point and create this kind of curve shape. So this kind of the heel of the curve, it actually decreases the contrast, makes the image softer. That's the reason. Then to increase the contrast between this cloud and the sky, the dark blue sky, then I will go to luminance and change the luminance of the blue sky. And this is what you can see, you can observe uh, in my image, it'll say this shot with Patagonia, with Torres del Paine, with dark blue sky. Besides the polarizer filter, I also decreased uh, the blue, the luminance of the blue color. Here, in this case, I couldn't use the polarizer, right? Because uh, the sun is setting behind me, so it's uh, heating up the Mount Fuji itself, so I just cannot use the polarizer. I use it only 90 degrees from the sun. And this is now a challenging part, how to bring the colors from this little cloud here. So what I will try to do, I'll create a little gradient that matches exactly this shape, like this, the shape of the cloud and probably add a little bit more of the orange color and more of magenta. So kind of mixing uh, orange and magenta, creating this uh, brown uh, kind of look of the cloud. And then to add even more contrast to the sky, I'm increasing the contrast for the top. But you see, when I'm increasing the contrast, the sky becomes more saturated. So while increasing the contrast, you always need to go back to HSL, to saturation of the blue, and desaturate the blue. And unfortunately, in Lightroom, you cannot create masks except of this range mask. So if you want to separately edit, even more separately, like little pieces of your image landscape, you still must go to Photoshop and create masks there. This is the thing, yeah, in Lightroom, it's like you process the image in general. So you can just create gradient, maybe separate the image, like separate the whole sky from the land. But if you want to edit separately, let's say the tree or the cloud, it's much more efficient to go to Photoshop and uh, create masks in Photoshop. But still, uh, we decrease the saturation of the blue and decreased, ex yeah, we decreased exposure I increase the contrast and I will decrease exposure also for the sky. And for the bottom as well, the same story. Yeah, increasing contrast and decreasing exposure like this. So let's compare before and after. So already it looks a little bit better.
then another image. It's uh, Ramana Falls in USA, in Oregon. So for this image, I just looked at it and uh, thought it's too many colors here, like a little bit yellow, or, and it's kind of mixing a bit with brown color, not in a good way. So I decided, uh, let's just make it monochrome. Yeah, so we'll desaturate most of the colors like this and shift the temperature a bit towards blue color like this. So the image will become monochrome. It's a cold, dark forest here. I will create a gradient from the right side, from the right corner, with decreasing exposure like this and decreasing exposure from the right side. Yeah, so it's a dark mood. Again, to bring details from the shadows, lifting the black point up. But here I will decrease the curve. So opposite from creating soft image, I will, I'm creating a dark moody image here. Still a bit uh, of overexposed areas from the top. So I'm creating a radial filter from the top and decreasing exposure here. But meanwhile, you see, uh, even I decreased exposure, the saturation of the blue, it, uh, it just also becomes, the blue become more saturated. For this reason, I need to desaturate it a bit more. Oh, I even had it here, the saturation. So anyway, I will desaturate it a little bit more, increase the contrast, and add a little bit more texture to the water. Clarity and texture. So this is it, monochrome image. So eliminated all other colors like this. Yeah, it's all about the ideas, about ideas behind the images. Some pictures, they can look almost black and white, like this one from Indonesia. You can barely read any color, so the histogram is, looks quite nice from black to white. And still, Again, you can just find some magenta, some sunrise colors here, and some emerald colors. So it's all about uh, finding something beautiful in the image. Again, so you cannot just draw the colors. Yeah, you still need to pick them from the image, how they look like. And the same with light. It's always also about the light direction. And uh, I can feel here that the light goes from the left side. It was sunrise, but very, very subtle sunrise. But still on my screen, I can see a bit of colors. So I can just enhance these colors. If I couldn't see them, if I couldn't uh, uh, capture even subtle colors, I can just draw them on the image, especially on this neutral kind of uh, look of the sky. Yeah? So I'm going to bring a bit more of the pink and magenta from the sky and again bring up the emerald color of the grass. So let me select the gradient and I will decrease exposure, increase the contrast and you see even increasing the contrast uh, I start getting some blue color in the sky. So I just need to shift the blue towards magenta. Again magenta and uh, emerald, one of my favorite combinations, right? And decreasing highlights here like this. And then for the foreground, opposite thing. Yeah, just uh, I will add exposure for the foreground and I will add the saturation. So where is the saturation? Right here. Yeah, by the way, many people ask uh, and a bit confused about difference between vibrance and saturation here. Vibrance and saturation. So what's the difference? When you saturate your image, all the pixels, they saturated equally. But when you use the vibrance tool, in vibrance, the most saturated parts of the image, like uh, the sky is already quite saturated with blue, we don't need to get it more. With vibrance, only like middle pixels, which are less saturated, not reach the top saturation affected. So saturation is for all the pixels and vibrance just for less saturated pixels. So if you 
don't want to kill your image with oversaturation, you can use the vibrance, and it's much more gentle approach to increase the saturation of your image. So just add a little bit more vibrance here, and overall color temperature. I think I will shift it again a bit more towards magenta like this. And the light, yeah, remember I told, it, uh, told you that the light coming from the left side, so how to emphasize it, I will uh, create a gradient again, like this, for the light. Gradient comes from the left side, a little bit more light, a bit more shadow, like this, and the shadow from the right side. Yes, I will create a linear gradient, gradient filter, with decreased exposure. And put it from the right side like this, all the way. So eventually what we have? We have a kind of feel of uh, more light coming from the left side and shadow from the right side. Again, dark blue sky and maybe a little bit more from the bottom as well to give the eyesight into the frame. So I will add a little bit more like this. So again, it's all about the direction of the light as well. So let's check before and after. I'm definitely getting some color, so some basic correction here. So one of the images, uh, this is from Saudi Arabia. It's from Tabuk region in the north of Saudi. So I will crop it a little bit. So this is how it uh, looks like from the beginning, no editing here. And uh, again, the color combination, do you remember? We studied it, like with Eagle Hunters, we have here the pale orange, the pale color here, and the blue color. Again, the complementary colors. And the idea with this image will be to bring uh, a little bit more pink and orange from the sky and also bring more details from the pillars, from the rocks themselves. So let me create a gradient again from the top, like this. Decreasing exposure, increase the saturation. But again, I'm increasing saturation and I see this oversaturated blue sky, which is not that nice. So I'm shifting the temperature, the color temperature from cold to warm. So basically just adding a bit more temperature and uh, a bit more magenta here, a bit more tint. So this is how you get away from the saturated blue color. You're just shifting it towards warmer color and bringing the color of the sky as well. But again, I'm not trying to uh, just add excessive temperature like this. So when I'm adding excessive temperature, the image, it looks like it's more toned in one color. I'm trying to keep the diversity of colors in my post-processing. So this is uh, always a, a balance. So I'm trying to still keep this blue color over there. It's not just monochrome image I'm talking about. Yeah, it's uh, complementary colors, the brown and the blue, so keeping it. All right, and how to bright up the rocks? I will choose the Radial gradient, the circular one. Just default zero parameters, create it. And again, range mask. Using luminous range mask. I'm adding exposure, adding shadows here, like this, and cutting off the bright color of the sky. It works quite efficiently, yeah, we can move it up and down, find the best position, so all the details revealed. Then, how to create a polarizing kind of effect? Again, I can go to HSL, I can go to luminance, and decrease the luminance of the blue. But just be very careful, if you're decreasing the luminance of the blue, I will show you what will happen if you get to minus 70 or so. Let's zoom in. 
And here we go, you have bending. You have this little white, white uh, stripe here on the edge, like this. So always try to avoid the bending. So let's see how it will look like if I apply just minus 20, minus 30, like this. I think the edge is somewhere minus 30, minus 40, then you don't have the, this uh, kind of bending, right? But uh, look at that. So we just creating polarizing kind of effect and the bringing out the clouds, the separate fluffy clouds from this image. Then emphasizing attention on some nice lines on the foreground. I like this kind of sand and uh, little lines here. So I'm going to add the clarity little bit more clarity, highlights and whites lifting up along with exposure like this. Trying to make a soft gradient, soft transition. Sometimes it's worth making uh, a few gradients, maybe one a bit smaller just for the rocks and add a little bit even more clarity like this. So this is it. And what about the saturation of the blue? So I feel like the, uh, we still can go to saturation of the blue channel and put it down like this. So again, creating the pale blue color, not the screaming blue color. Okay, let's check how it looks like. So this is how it looks like after Lightroom. So now, uh, what? Can we do with these images we just processed? I can uh, go to Photoshop and show you also some tricks I'm using in uh, Photoshop to emphasizing the light and the uh, direction of the light and working with colors. So we can start even with this image. I can open it, edit in Photoshop. This is Panorama, by the way. This Panorama that uh, was uh, DNG, yeah, you see the name was taken on F16, it's a 100 and 115 of a second with a tripod. I was quite low to the foreground. Always when I planning my compositions like this, I always trying to be very low. So we have this kind of lines, beautiful textures. It's almost uh, this way. Yeah, like up to knees, like this. And F16 focusing on the foreground, just vertical images, so a few, like two or three vertical images here. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's a stitched panorama from three vertical images. It's uh, no focus stacking, nothing. Just F16, focusing on some rocks on the foreground. And yeah, yeah. Just uh, shifted the camera like this on 14. Yes, the same, the same points here in this image. It's just a classical panorama from vertical images. Sometimes I do a vertical panorama. It's more complicated yeah, when you have horizontal frames and you just pan your camera up like this. So eventual final image is uh, vertical. Yeah, but this one is just classical, focusing on one spot on uh, hyperfocal distance, basically on the closest distance uh, you can get to have everything from foreground to infinity sharp. Maybe focusing on uh, like 50, 60 centimeters from the camera on F16, Ooh, like this, yeah, on the foreground. So here we go. We open this image in uh, uh, Photoshop. By the way, I'm trying always to keep an eye on the color wheel and measure colors when I'm editing my images. So you can see the color wheel here. It's already familiar. All right, so I can uh, check the color, the blue one here, so this one, and check the brown color, this one, yep. Complementary, right? Exactly what we studied in theory. One here and one here, complementary colors. Well, so what's next? What tricks do I have to emphasize the light and color? Uh, the first trick is color overlays. 
maybe a little bit more advanced from Lightroom, but we'll see. Maybe some of you already know how to manage layers and color overlays. If you don't, I'll just uh, slowly show you. So normally I will create a new layer, just clicking on the plus icon here. And again, it's idea about the light, like how we edit image from Indonesia, with Vulcano, with Bromo eruption. The light. The light comes from the left side, from here, and the shadow is from the right side. So it's, again, it's all about the light and shadow, the balance between light and shadow. So I need to emphasize the light from the left side and minimize the light from the right side. Easy idea? Yeah, let's do it. And how to do it practically? Practically, I will use color overlays. So I will create this layer one, and then I will choose the color, the light color, yeah, from the sky. Let's say this one. This is sort of the color of uh, the light, of the sun, sunset. I will choose the gradient, this one, the radial gradient, and just to make sure when, if you are not uh, editing in Photoshop, if you just open it, you need to make sure that, it's a bit in Russian, but <laughs> I'll translate here. This type of gradient is called uh, from background to transparent, from background color to transparent. So just find it here in basic, in basic gradient. You need to open it, it will be here. Foreground and background colors. So this is the color of the foreground. This is just called like this. These are colors in swatches. You have two colors. Normally, I have one color warm here and another cold for shadows. So you'll see how it works. Foreground, yeah, so the color you choose and it will be the color of the gradient. Just double checking it. You can see it here, even on the preview. This is the color. So let me select 100% and just show you uh, just how it works. Yes, without uh, practice for now, just how it works. So it creates this kind of circles, right? Just a circle with color and it's additive. So you can use as many as you want, the smaller ones, the big ones. <laughs> I will not spoil the image anymore. My daughter actually, she really loves to play with these gradients a lot. It's, uh, because it's easy thing, it's very easy to draw. Yeah, you don't need to be a painter or artist to draw such gradients. But look how we can use it. We can draw the gradient from the left side, but not 100% like this. We can change the opacity. We can change it down to about 20 or 30%. Maybe check the 30 like this. Draw one big gradient. Draw another smaller just between. Emphasizing the light. Yeah, how. The light, it hits the rocks, not from the right side, but mostly from the left. And it's all soft, but definitely I will not keep it like this, guys. So this is just a temporary layer. And for this layer, I will uh, put down opacity, normally to about 30, 40%. But before doing that, we forgot about shadows. We forgot about the right side, the dark side of the image. So I will select the blue color and I will change the brightness. I will select the similar tone, the same tone of the sky. This is the idea. So the colors, they must be natural to the scene. It's not some random color like some pink or some, I don't know, magenta color. I'm choosing the color from the sky. Yeah, this, the color that already was there, it existed in this image. This is the philosophy of uh, this processing. So I will select. The same tone, just darker one, the blue one. And I will use this time linear gradient and draw it from the right side and draw it from the bottom. Maybe a little bit more like this and like this. And probably for the foreground, I will select the color from the foreground shadow as well. Just some shadows in between rocks like this. The shadow from below. So it looks like just some color overlay, yeah? So we, it's just a temporary layer. So what we need to do now, we need to push down the opacity to about 15, 20%. You already almost can't notice 
these gradients, right? But they're softening. They make the image softer. So this magic look, it's one of the things is here, but it's not only about the layer in normal mode. You see, it's normal mode, it's half transparent, it's just adding a little bit more color on top. But to emphasize the light, we need to duplicate this layer, so create layer one copy. Let's say copy one. And shift the blending mode. There are different blending mo modes here, but even if you're not familiar with everything here, you can shift to overlay. So the blending mode must be overlay. And look what's going to happen on 100% of opacity. Yeah, so from zero to 100. It's a very simple and easy way to emphasize the game between the light and the shadow. So just with these few gradients, we changed the balance between shadow and light. And that's a super easy way to do it. I don't even use the mouse here. Sometimes I'm just sitting uh, in airplane and editing images. So it's uh, much more time to actually explain the idea than to process the image itself. Maybe when I process it myself, I can spend like seven, 10 minutes maximum on the entire process from stitching panorama to having the final result. So this is very quick and very essential way of processing. No need to draw any masks, nothing. You see we apply the range mask to separate the rocks from the sky. Then we draw a few gradients to emphasize the balance between the light and shadow. And the image is almost ready. So this is my approach. And uh, you have this kind of, oh yes, I will switch off and on. So this is the trick, one of the tricks here. Of course, besides that, uh, there are a little bit more complicated techniques like luminosity masking. I think I will not cover it because it just will explode your brain <laughs> yeah, today. But uh, to understand about luminosity masking, you can just write it down. There are also a few tutorials, so say, by Jimmy McIntyre. And he got uh, some panels uh, that help to create automatically luminosity masking. Some easy panel and uh, panels for creating mask, special masking. But I will not do it here. Other than that, I will show you also how to work with details. You remember I told you basically for which reasons I'm using Lightroom and for which reasons I'm using Photoshop. I'm using Photoshop to go into small details. So Lightroom works very well for overall image when you want to edit the sky separately, the land, so, but this is still big pieces. Yeah, like if you want to go into small details, let's go to Photoshop and maybe here we will work also with dodge and burning and emphasize details of the foreground, emphasize the little light here on the rocks themselves. So how to do it? I'm doing dodge and burning not just with a tool, with Photoshop tool, you have it here, but I'm creating a new layer and shifting it to the same blending mode overlay. The one we worked with before, overlay. And now let's say I want to emphasize the light on the foreground, on these lines on the of the foreground. So I will switch to overlay and select the brush. And again, select the color from the sky, like the bright one. Opacity might be about 30% like this, a soft brush. Very soft brush. And let's see how it works. Yes, yeah, so lighting up the foreground, creating more light. I can even go to smaller details like this. I, ha I have these lines, yes? Yeah? So I can draw a little bit more on the foreground. Like this way, this way, where I had already the light. So I'm not actually inventing it. It was there, but very subtle. I'm just emphasizing what I already had. Here again, so I have the light on these rocks here. It's a little bit more light. Of course, you can be a little bit more accurate with this, it's just quickly showing you. And how to draw the shadows? You must select the dark color. So you're selecting the dark color. You can vary opacity from 
20, from 15, 20 percent, depending on the situation. And here I also draw some darker lines, like shadows, emphasizing shadows. So now I'm going in Photoshop in these little details. And the more you go in details in Photoshop, the more attractive will image look like. Of course, trying not to ruin everything and uh, so it will not look artificial. Yes, but still nothing like this. Yeah, emphasize the, the foreground. It looks uh, a bit more three-dimensional. It looks like there is more light coming in the foreground. The same for the rocks, but the rocks we still must separate somehow from the actual sky. So how to get the rocks separated? I will use the quick selection tool here. And let's say we choose just this rock, well, maybe adjacent as well. Adjacent rocks. Selecting the land. So this is it. This is trick selection. This is not something like range mask. So you need to be very careful to create this kind of mask. I will just use the new layer again and create the mask. This little icon says add layer mask. So I'm just clicking on it. Here you can see it's very, very kind of strong mask. Yeah, but to uh, <coughs> see the properties of the mask, you can feather the mask. So that, uh, if you alt click, you can see it smooths the edges. So you definitely must feather the mask for about four to five pixels if you want to work with the mask. For those not familiar with masks in Photoshop, you see how it looks, yeah? So it, we selected the white color. So the white color, it's uh, something we can work with. So we can work with rocks separately from the sky. So this is how we separated them actually from the sky. And now we can apply any effects. We can add the color, we can add the curves to this space as well. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to select the gradients. And again, it's uh, in overlay mode. Overlay. Select the gradient from here, from the sky, the same color of the sunset. Opacity about 20, 30 percent here. I'm trying to add more light like this. More light here, more light from the left side as well. You see, I'm adding small gradients. They're additive. So I'm just clicking many times, or I can uh, select a little bit more opacity, so I will, uh, it will be stronger like this. And stronger here, just from the left side, emphasizing the light. And meanwhile, of course, I need to think about shadows as well. So I'm selecting the darker color, uh, probably opacity a little bit less, and working with these gradients from the right side. It's a little bit dark already on the top. So I'm just adding a little bit more here, and a little bit more. Uh, I don't like it, so you need to change opacity to a little bit less if it's too strong. And creating the shadow like this. So let's see how it looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we just emphasized uh, and make them three-dimensional. So light from the left side, shadow from the right side. It's all about understanding the light and color. So this is the image, yes. And uh, then I promised also to show you the image with horses a little bit opposite, very light, very high key image. So let's also, we have just about five minutes, yeah. So I will open this image and also show you how I can apply the same technique, balancing the light in this kind of image. It's also opening in Photoshop and meanwhile, just explain the idea again. The light is behind, but I want to soften the image. I want to make it more magical, yes? So for this reason, I will also apply some gradients just on the horses. Like this, I will create a new layer select the very bright color from the sunset sky, select the gradient here, it's called reflected gradient. Select opacity 20% and just draw this gradient. It, it will look like a haze. Yeah, maybe just draw more. You see it's like a haze or a line 
And I will draw a little bit more here using this golden color below and a little bit more white on the horses. So basically what happens, I'm adding a bit more white to the horses and a bit more golden color on the splashes or reflections. Uh, yeah, so let's, again, I will not leave the layer like this. As usual, I'm working with little small steps in Photoshop and this step will be about 20 percent like this. I can also duplicate it, make a copy like we did again. Layer one copy and again shifting it to overlay. Overlay. Yep, so the horses, they kind of shine right now. Yes, so white horses, golden splashes, this is it. Not sure if I will spend time now on the rider, but just as inside, uh, usually I'm removing uh, such objects or people using healing brush tool or using content aware fill in Photoshop. So you can just select the rider and try to apply content aware. In most cases it's working, but here it's too tight. So I just really doubt it will work. So you must go to edit fill and use content aware fill. So this is something that helps to remove the objects. Yeah, but in this case, we will just waste time on that. All right, so let's see if we have any other nice images. Well, images like this, let's say, with Antarctica, they already quite uh, nicely monochrome image. Uh, they have nice color, blue tones, so I just need to add a little bit more exposure, add a bit more clarity. And for this type of images, you can't do that much in color correction, in terms of color correction. So I really like images like we edited before, this one with the pillars, when you have difference in colors, different in light. So this is something to play with. But monochrome images, most of cases, I just decrease exposure, a little bit more contrast, a bit texture clarity, and this is it. Yeah. So this is how we work with the image. So I think we almost there at the end and we have some time for your questions guys, of course. Yeah. You mentioned in this image that uh, you used an ND filter which mm -hmm. also helps you to remove objects like Yes, people, people walking. Uh, I don't know, I don't understand the relation between the ND filter and the removal filter. Well actually what happens if you put ND filter, let's say 6 stop or 10 stop ND filter, your shutter speed becomes 15 seconds. Without the filter, it might be 150 of a second or so. Yeah, so on 150 of a second, there will be people like frozen, but on 15 seconds, they're moving. They're not just staying on the bridge. Yeah, they're walking. So 15 seconds, they're just blurring it. Yeah, it's very interesting uh, also technique to remove people in crowded places. So, but these would, you have to remove them later? No, they disappear. Yeah, like, like spirits, I don't know, uh, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, so for the image, how do you manage on the uh, eyes of the gun for shading or for ideal histogram? Uh, well, actually, there is not such a thing like ideal histogram for me. Why? Because in books, maybe you will read that ideal histogram should be from black to white like this, but remember, let's say, uh, painting from Caravaggio, right? If you look at the painting by Caravaggio, like the whole histogram will be here of the painting, all in the dark. So I'm more uh, just try to express my feelings, right? Like with horses. With horses, I wanted this image to be bright, to be in high key, so to show this air, to show how they run, and, but for dark, like this one with deep forest, yeah? So remember that we hiked for about 10, maybe five or six kilometers and like 12 both ways and it's like a deep dark forest. I wanted to show this feel and just look at the histogram here. It's almost all dark, yeah? So I'm more based uh, on my feelings and uh, on uh, what I felt there while taking the picture other than to some idyllic histogram here. Okay. 
Any other questions? Yes, please. Yeah, but not for not for this one. Let's say. Yeah, yeah, but uh, the one with the one with sunset or sunrise, like this uh, image from Saudi wood pillars. Uh, this one is uh, bracketed. It's bracketed. Yeah, I see the name here. HDR Pana. It's super easy to stitch it in Lightroom. You just make uh, three bracketed shots. Normally, it's mi classical minus two, zero, and plus two, and then you have uh, images like this, three images like this, and three like this. So totally uh, nine images, and you just select them and uh, ask Lightroom to make HDR Pana. It's super easy. Yeah, just one click, and everything. If everything is correct, correctly made you receive a beautiful panorama in HDR. So you can get all the details from lights and shadows easily. Any other questions? Yes, please. Yes, you can draw in Lightroom, yes, but uh, uh, the problem if you draw in Lightroom, uh, you can, in Photoshop, in Photoshop, it's actually a little bit more precise and you can vary the opacity. But you can achieve similar results. Just in Photoshop, it's uh, more flexible. You can create a layer and then you can change the opacity easier. And then on the same layer, you can uh, draw both light and shadow. So it just gives you a bit uh, more flexibility. And, uh, in Lightroom, yeah, in Lightroom it's more quicker, I'd say, more faster. In Photoshop, it's you really going in details, and even at home, I really like to use the tablet. I'm using the Wacom tablet, and I'm using the brush. So what happens with the brush? You can make this little strokes very precise. When you use the brush, you can vary the opacity, you can vary the size of the brush, which you cannot do in Lightroom. So with variation of the size, you can let's say make the sharp tip here, and then it just expand like this, the brush. Depends on the pressure of the pen. So also helps to work with the little details, more precise, yeah. yeah. Mm, kind of, yeah, imagination of a painter maybe also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, yeah, still, I think that uh, I t I'm trying to find something that was there already. Like I'm trying not to uh, change the colors completely, but pick up the colors from there, like we did. Yeah, pick pick the color from the sunrise here or from the shadow. Then these colors, this processing, it looks a little bit more natural. I do not enter some artificial colors not native to the image. Any other questions? Yes, please. Good question. Uh, yeah, 14 and panorama. Basically, the question is uh, why I can't make it in one frame, just in one image, but I needed a panorama here. So the answer is because I wanted to be very close to the foreground. Of course, I can make a step back and shoot on 14, everything in one frame, but I wanted to be very close to the foreground and use these rocks like kind of leading lines. And you can notice that on many of my images, this wide three-dimensional foreground. In most cases, it's super close to the foreground. Maybe you remember also the image from, uh, from Tuscany I show you with the uh, yellow flowers on the foreground. The distance to the flower is like this. Yes, yeah, so flowers are very small ones. Basically, this is what creates this three-dimensional depth in landscape. You just always look under your feet and trying to find the leading lines, try to be close to them. What happens if you step up? you won't see these lines anymore. Everything will start to be messy, like little rocks here, and these rocks will just distract the attention. Other than creating leading lines and perspective, something that at least will push you in the frame. It will be just small, destructive elements 
on the foreground. So always need to think about how you build perspective, which foreground elements you're using. That's something that people forget to use and maybe something that uh, also makes a difference like this picture here, a bit more classical from Patagonia, right? You get super impressive foreground with this nice flow of water. Still have beautiful mountains, right? You can, can take just a postcard picture, just the mountains and the sky, but the foreground makes a difference, make the flow and uh, just makes this three-dimensional look. All right, anything else? Yes, please. Yes, and I actually like distortion in landscape. I like it very much. Why? Let's see what's hap what happens here with this picture. Yeah, so mountains, they actually become smaller in horizontal state, right? But I just uh, found this image from almost the same place, but the vertical one. So let me find it in previews. I just seen it in my folder. Yeah, this is one. Same mountains, but because it's vertical, because of distortion, the mountains, they look taller. In horizontal state, they would look like very small, but if you're using uh, 14 millimeter, 14, 16 millimeter wide angle lens, using the vertical state of the camera, then the mountains, they visually just grow like this. So no need to stretch them, Photoshop or anything. It's just you put them close to the upper edge, and visually, distortion helps you to enlarge the mountain. So distortion, actually, in landscape, it works on you, for you. Of course, it's a bit different in cityscape. You cannot do this in cityscape in Dubai. Burj Khalifa will just fall like this, yeah? So you need to keep the line straight opposite. But in landscape, it's super useful, yeah. Any other questions? All right, I hope, guys, that you get something new today, both from theory and practice. And just again, remember that colors, it's, uh, they're very powerful colors, yes? On one hand, the colors can bring some beauty to your images. On the other, you can just destroy your images with HDR, with excessive contrast clarity. So always try to bring some magic to images. And also try to train your say, yourself, train your, train your brain, your eye, your taste for better images, maybe get inspiration from paintings, from uh, different famous photographers. It's not happening in instance. Yeah, just you read the book, you learn the course, and then you have just fantastic choice of colors. It's about developing your style, right? It just happens with years. So try to invest your time also for some beautiful things. Watch the beautiful movie or watch beautiful paintings. Yes? One last question, sorry. Is there any, in your experience, any uh, software you're taking before you go to Lightroom uh, mm -hmm. that you know that this is never going to work no matter what you do with it in Lightroom? Mm -hmm. What are the basic minimal things mm -hmm. that is required? Yeah, it actually happens. Yeah, it happens. For this reason, what I'm doing, I'm importing in Lightroom not just one image, but kind of press selection of similar images. Let's say, let's take this example from Patagonia. There were so many tries to make this kind of image because it's super close by and the waves were just crashing and I was all wet, the camera was wet, and I didn't even know if uh, the image was sharp because it was shaking with the wind. So eventually I've selected maybe 10, 15 images like this and finally selected, the, selected this one because of the movement of the waves, because it was sharp, no water on the lens. So still there are many factors like this. And uh, that's why you need to uh, first make a press selection. The selection process is super essential for photographer. And uh, normally when I select images, uh, let's say from this trip to Dubai, I'm pretty sure I have lots of images with fog for sunrises. And uh, maybe out of 1,000 or 2,000 images, I will press select 100. And out of 100 press selection, it will be five, six images only. 
So five, six images from one or two thousand is it's a good result actually. Yeah, so it's all about the choice, the images you choose, how you choose, and uh, kind of uh, selection low, natural selection low for images only the best survive and then they just go to another trip and just don't have time to process the images with lower level. Right. Any other questions? We're almost time, yeah, to finish. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. It's also a Valentine Day, of course. Yeah. Happy Valentine. <laughs> it's my little Valentine for you guys. Yeah, <laughs> little cool. little heart. <laughs> yes, it's a big big sacrifice, yeah. Some of you may Yeah. You are welcome. I hope you will not get in trouble <laughs> leaving <laughs> leaving <laughs> for workshop. Yeah, still catch the dinner, yeah. get some flowers, yeah. <laughs> After tomorrow, yeah. So t tomorrow is still another folk day. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Of course, you are very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> we are, it's yeah. It's a very special folk, by the way. Mm -hmm. It is unlike other folk, I mean, and we what, had last year. What's special? <laughs> uh, 